Kavanka Resources are our final company of the evening. They're an, a CAV, an exploration company, expl uh, targeting the discovery of world-class mineral deposits in Botswana, specifically in the Kalahari Suture Zone and the Kalahari Copper Belt. Um, in the KSV, Kavango, Kavango is proving the use of sophisticated remote sensing technologies and data modeling of the findings to identify drill targets for metal sulfides. And in the Kalahari Copper Belt, Kavango is targeting large-scale copper-silver deposits and working in two separate joint ventures, firstly with Power Metal Resources, who you may remember featured in our November the 3rd uh, webinar last year. Very interesting uh, they were too. If you'd like to research them, but there you go. And secondly, they're JVing with LVR Geo Explorers. Ben Tarney, Executive Director at Kavango, is making the investment case for the company tonight. Over to you, Ben. Great. Thank you, Donald. Thank you very much. So if I share my screen. This evening, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk you through um, the, the case for Kavango as a stock to, to be in your portfolio. We've obviously given a lot of um, promotion recently. We've done a lot of other presentations. I've gone into a lot of detail about the technical aspects of the project, but tonight I want to focus on some of the more practical aspects of buying into a company like ours. Explain a bit about the rationale as to why I joined the board back in January and what really attracted me to working with this company over several others as a genuine exploration firm with the opportunity to deliver potentially life-changing returns for our shareholders. So we have the usual disclaimer here. Um, I have to leave that up on screen for a moment so that people can digest this. Um, we've also got to be very careful about uh, financial promotion rules and what have you. But I want to give you as honest a view as I can. Um, as a, a retail investor myself, this is my background. I've been active in this market now for 12 years. And walk you through four of the key areas that I always use to try and judge a company. Now, I've had a few um, disasters in my career. Some of those have been quite highly uh, publicized. Some investments I've made have not gone so well, but others, thankfully, have gone extremely well. And we started off this evening with uh, Touchstone Resource, Touchstone Exploration, sorry, I should say, which is one of the, the companies that I backed back in 2017. And the, the, the job that Paul and his team have done there has been absolutely phenomenal. So it was fantastic to, to listen to him earlier. And I think they really exemplify what I feel is the, the best of this market and what can really be achieved when you have a management team that's working genuinely to deliver a world class project. So the screen that we have up in front of us is um, sort of an outline of the four areas that, that I'll typically use when I'm looking at a, at a company deciding whether or not to put my money into it. So resources investing in the small cap space, it's a pretty brutal environment to work in. As investors, you know, we have to be very careful. We have to be very alive to, frankly, the lies that can be told to us by many companies and by many directors as they try and convince us to part with our money. But in broad terms, I think there are four areas that, that we can look at in a business that even with publicly available information and all of the pitfalls there can often be about what a company has actually presented to the, the public. But there are four key areas that once we've really got to the bottom of as a, as, a, as a private investor, and once we've satisfied ourselves that what was being told to us is honest, is truthful, is a genuine representation of the business that we're thinking about putting our money into, if we can tick off all four of these areas, then we've identified a stock that really is worth buying and holding. So this evening, what I'd like to do is make exactly this pitch to you as the director of Kavango Resources. So the first area that I always look at at the beginning is management alignment. Now, no matter what any director ever tells you, they, their interests will never truly be aligned with yours. Even sitting here in front of you this evening, I'm now a director and an officer of Kavango Resources. I'm quite a significant shareholder. I put quite a lot of money into this business personally before I joined the board as disclosed as part of the disclosure when, when I joined the company. But sitting to you this evening, I'm not an investor in Kavango anymore. I'm a director of the company and that's quite a crucial difference. So as much as our board at Kavango has significant skin in the game, we don't face the same sort of choices that you do as an investor in our company. But even so, there are still a number of things that you can look for just to see the extent to which our interests are aligned with yours. Now, this might seem a little bit backwards in terms of thinking, because I think a lot of retail investors, they look at the projects first. But I put that as the second item this evening to, to look at when assessing a company, because, of course, the projects matter. You have to look at the overall project quality. But unfortunately, as we all know, the disclosure requirements you know, on the stock exchange, they can sometimes leave a few holes in them. So what we think we're investing in or 
planning to put our money into, the actual evidence and the actual facts underlying that or supporting the value case, they can sometimes be somewhat missing, let's say, putting it kindly. Next, and what's obviously extremely important with all of these businesses is company financing. Now, we all know that placings, more often than not, they're done at discounts and heavily discounted placings. Those can be death to a, a share price and the traction that that can gain in the market. It's always vitally important to get an idea of what a company's cash burn is, how much, com how much cash that company has, how much working capital it has access to, and can it fund its uh, working its work program commitments over the following 12 to 18 months. And as I'm about to present to you at Cavango, I believe we're in an extremely strong position. And finally, and I think this is something that's often overlooked, is the consistency of the narrative. Now, when you go back and you look through a company's um, announcements, it's always good to look back over three or four years, see what that company promised, see what they said they would do, and then match that up against what the company actually did. If you find there are any major discrepancies, that's usually an obvious red flag. But what I hope to show you today is how Cavango, while it's certainly made a number of mistakes over the years, and we have, and some of them have been quite costly, overall, what we have achieved, we've, um, we've said we, we've, we've done what we said we would do, we've achieved what we've set out to do, um, albeit there have been times when the plan has needed to change, as often happens in resource exploration. But I really do feel that we as a business are one of the most honest exploration companies out in the market. So the slide that I have in front of you now, um, I just have to minimize this, is the, um, the, the current share structure. So I talked a little bit earlier on about management alignment. Now, normally a lot of um, if there are other management teams, I'd like to highlight this figure, which I'm highlighting on the slide here, which shows that the manager, the current directors, senior management and founders of the company hold 25%. But what I'd actually like to draw your attention to is this bit of information here. Our current board cost at Cavango is £160,000 a year. So that's for our entire board of directors. So for if I look at like other companies that are out there, that can be the cost of the CEO in many cases. At Cavango, we have a philosophy where our commitment is to put as many pounds into the ground, exploration pounds into the ground as we possibly can. So we run an extremely tight ship. Our, um, our operating overhead, our PLC overhead is about £430,000 a year in total, which compares extremely favourably pretty much to all of our peers. We, our commitment to using your money to put it into exploration is very sincere. Now, of course, we do have this 25% figure that I'm highlighting now. You know, we do have a lot of skin in the game. This is obviously after a number of rounds of financing as well. So our board of directors, they have participated in the fundraisings that there have been. They've maintained their stakes. And as a result of that, our management interests are to see Cavan go through to making major, and we're hoping to make a number of these, major discoveries uh, of, of metal deposits in Botswana, which is our main area of operation. Now, our first project, moving on to the second area, of course, is project quality. So our flagship project, as many people know, is the Kalahari Suture Zone. There's a lot of information we've put out in the public domain. Um, our provide a, a brief, inf um, brief overview now. But the KSZ is a 450 kilometer long magnetic anomaly in the southwest corner of Botswana. It was first identified in the 1970s by airborne surveys that were flown by a um, Canadian aid program that flew extensive airborne surveys over Botswana with the aim of helping you know, the Botswana mining industry develop to help the, company, the country's economy grow. Now, when the KSZ was first identified, there was a huge amount of excitement about it. The, 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 the geology itself lies underneath about 70 meters of Kalahari cover, which means that all of the, the regional geolo geology is, is obscured from view. So this meant historic exploration was pretty much zero because obviously no one could see what was underneath the sands. So when the airborne surveys were flown in the 1970s and they identified this 450 kilometer long anomaly, it immediately um, caused a lot of excitement because of the analogue with the Norilsk Mining Centre in northern Russia. Now, Norilsk was originally discovered back in the 1920s and production began there. And even today, after 100 years of nearly continuous production, it's still one of the world's major sources for copper, nickel and platinum group elements. So when the KSZ was first identified and it was shown it had a very similar um, magnetic profile to Norilsk, it was also the uh, geological position of this project that really caught people's attention. So in the middle part of this slide, you can see that the KSZ 
sits just on the western edge of the Cap Val Craton in southwest Botswana, very simple, similar to um, the, the Norilsk sensor, which sits on the western edge of the Siberian Craton in northern Russia. Now, the significance of that is that as Cratons moved through tectonic activity over millions of years, where the tectonic plates moved apart, this caused obviously areas of significant volcanic activity. And it was those periods of prolonged volcanic activity that brought to surface a lot of what we now use as the world's, metal, the world's major metal deposits. So to have discovered this frankly virgin territory um, at this time in the 70s, it did attract a lot of interest. The problem that companies faced back then and a number of businesses like Falcon Bridge and other major Canadian firms who explored the KSA previously, the problem that they faced was that te technology at the time wasn't sophisticated enough to enable them to penetrate through the Kalahari cover, through those 70 meters of sands, to get a, a clear idea of the underground geology to identify clearly de delineated drill targets. So we felt uh, when we first set the company up or when our founders first set it up back in 2012, that was the opportunity now. Technology had, had advanced to such a point that they felt these new modern methods could be deployed in the Kalahari suture zone and used obviously to find what we hope will be major metal ore bodies. Now what we're looking at on this screen um, is a slide that I've presented recently and it highlights uh, one of the limitations of the old airborne technology that was first used to identify the Kalahari suture zone. So what you're looking at is um, a top-down view of the AEM surveys originally flown. And what we can see here, just in this area that I'm highlighting uh, with my cursor, is hole CKP8. Now this was drilled back in about 1985-86 by a Canadian company and it was the deepest hole that was ever drilled in the Kalahari suture zone down to about 450 meters but it was abandoned. It was abandoned because the drilling company at the time didn't encounter any metal sulfides and so therefore they got to 450 meters and they felt that it was a dud hole. Our view is that actually they made a mistake and what they should have done at the time is focused on this magnetic anomaly um, which is over to the west. And what I'm now going to show you on the next slide, also the one after, is the results of our TDEM surveys. Now, um, what we can see here very, very clearly is the magnetic anomaly that the Canadians originally made, made their original uh, drill, um, drill target decision on was based on the Proterozoic Gabbro, which lies about 900 metres below the Karoo Age Gabbro um, on top. Now, the Proterozoic Gabbros were, from, were formed originally about 1.1 billion years ago um, during that period of prolonged volcanic activity. Now, when looking at the airborne survey back on this slide, the airborne magnetics, because it's quite a blunt instrument, it picked up what is also a very heavily magnetic conductive body. So this area here, which you can see, um, which is what the Canadians decided to drill, slap bang in the middle of, coincides pretty much exactly with this magnetic body that we're looking here at a depth of about 900 meters. Now, even with modern mining techniques and modern exploration technology, realistically to open up a new mining frontier, these targets are far too deep. So what we've created using TDEM technology and using modern, sorry, using modern airborne um, technology, we've created a, an underground 3D model that's distinguished and differentiated between the Karoo Age Gabbros, which are about 180 million years old, and those much deeper, much older Proterozoic Gabbros, which are about 1.1 billion. And what you're looking at now um, is the result of this work. So we flew these surveys in, air, air, these airborne surveys in 2019. They covered the entire northern section of the Kalahari suture zone. And from the data that we gathered from this quite extensive survey that we flew, we processed internally using our own methods that our own in-house team has, has developed, but also worked very closely with a company called Miro Geoscience based down in Australia. Now in partnership with Miro, the map that we created when we first got the results, it was just incredibly exciting. Because as you can see here, very clearly, we have these characteristic Norilsk style keel and gull wing formations. Now what's significant about that is that these formations mirror almost identically the Norilsk, um, the Norilsk deposits that are even today, some of the world's richest deposits of um, nickel, 
and copper and platinum group metals. So we've written a lot about this in our RNSs, but this image in particular is very powerful because what we're looking at is target area A in this area of the TDEM surveys that we subsequently um, performed and I'm about to show you some results of. Now, what you can see on this image um, is if you look here, you see this vertical red line, you can see hole CKP8. It penetrated through the gabbro and was obviously then abandoned. But this area here is where we've discovered um, this target A2 that I'm about to show the results of. So jumping ahead to back to this slide, the first survey that we ran was target area A1. And the reason that we picked this area was simply because this historic hole had been drilled here, which we've used the data from to learn a lot about the potential of the, um, the, the Kalahari suture zone to host magmatic sulfide ore bodies. So the drill core that we've, we've we recovered from the warehouses in Kang, we've analyzed, we've had a number of world-renowned ex experts go and um, perform various types of analysis on, on, the, on the drill cores, and they've identified what are called primary sulfides. Now, the primary sulfides are extremely important because, we, because we've identified that these, four, these primary sulfides actually formed, what that's told tells us about the system as a whole, the Karoo Age Gabbro system, is that this actually is conducive to holding metallic ore bodies somewhere within, we hope, our, our target, our, our license areas. So the, the first TDEM survey that we ran was over this area, and you can see an outline here of the one kilometer squared copper wire that was run out to conduct the survey. Now we have other material that we published on our website that shows how the TDEM surveys work. So I won't go into too much detail about that now. But what you can actually see here is that the first TDEM survey returned nothing in terms of um, an, an interesting conductive hit. Instead, all we confirmed was the existence of the Proterozoic Gabbro at a much deeper level. However, when we moved on to the second TDEM survey, Area A2, things became a lot more exciting for us a lot, you know, extremely quickly, because what we immediately identified was target A2, which we've written about um, in RNSs that we've published. Now, what you're looking at here, this red zone, this is the conductive target. It's one kilometer long. It's giving off a reading of 3000 Siemens, which is extremely significant because they're reading anything above a thousand Siemens suggests it could be a metal ore body. So we're looking forward to drilling this target later on this year. But what we're particularly encouraged by is the position of this, this target relative to the Karoo Age Gabbro. So our key target area, if I jump back to our 3D model, is we're looking for the formation of potential metallic sulfide, metal sulfide ore bodies in the walls and at the bottom of these keel formations. This is exactly the type of formation that exists in Norilsk. These are the, the formations that have been mined for a very long time and have obviously yielded such incredible volumes of, of nickel, copper and platinum group metal, metals. And what we're looking at with this target A2 is a highly conductive target in exactly the right uh, geological setting that our model predicted with exactly the right, what we hope is exactly the right conductive reading coming off. So if I now move on to the Kalahari Copper Belt, this is an area that is um, a project area of ours that is sometimes often overlooked. There's a lot of investor interest in the Kalahari Suture Zone. But one of the things that sets Kavango apart from many other exploration companies at this, this end of the market is we have two genuinely world-class projects. The potential in the KSZ, in the Kalahari Suture Zone, is pure blue sky. We're looking to open up there a new mining district that if we're right and if we're able to discover these, these uh, nickel sulfide or copper sulfide ore bodies, the, the, the returns will just be you know, staggering. But in the copper belt, we've used our in-country exploration team to secure two joint ventures with a local company, LVR Resource, LVR Geo Resources, and with Power Metal Resources that's listed um, on, on AIM. Now, over the last um, three months, we've made a lot of progress in the Kalahari copper belt. And we released an update uh, just over uh, 10 days ago, where we provided our first uh, results from the airborne surveys that we flew um, over the copper belt. And what I'm going to show you here, this is the first image that we've released of this, um, but this information is all in the public domain. If you refer back to the uh, recent South Guernsey updates, we described in detail um, about targets Acacia and Marula. 
what this image here shows is a visual depiction of the results that we, we already published. But what I'd like to do today is just draw your attention to some of the, the key points about why we're so excited about these targets in particular and why we think we could be looking at something really quite exciting in this project area. So when we first secured the South Guernsey project um, license areas, what attracted us most was if you follow the mouse cursor down this part of the screen, you can see a slight discoloration to the south of it. This area here is what's known as a fold nose, a plunging fold nose. So imagine the Earth's surface as it's moved over millions of years and the Earth has pushed underneath sort of this section of this upper section of Earth at the top here. Now, across the Kalahari copper belt, there have been a number of major discoveries, major copper discoveries. And this fold nose that we described in the RNS, this type of formation has yielded some of the best, such as, for example, the T3 discovery that was originally made by Mod Resources and Metal Tiger about five years ago. Now, so we were already attracted by the area, so we then flew uh, airborne surveys over this region. And what we immediately identified were two, in this particular segment of South Guernsey, two very large conductive targets um, that aligned pretty much exactly with the geological model that was the original reason that we bought into or we, we applied for these licenses. Now, the main conductor that we identified actually crosses over into Sandfire's ground. So the license immediately to the north of uh, South Guernsey is, is owned by Sandfire. And as you can see, it crosses over into the border. But what we've done since is we've conducted some fairly extensive soil sample testing across these two targets. Now, what's particularly interesting about this is that you'll note that the soil sample readings that we're displaying here, these are the copper readings. It's not zinc that we're looking at. Zinc is often used as a pathfinder element for some of the copper um, discoveries that there have been in the Kalahari um, copper belt, uh, because zinc is a much more mobile element within the Earth's surface. Um, so therefore, if the zinc is present, it's used as an indicator of other metals that might also be present and has been used to deline delineate uh, drill targets. What's very significant for us about what we're looking at on this image here is that these are copper readings. Now, copper is a much less mobile element than zinc, but for us to have, and, and it's also traveled through about 20 meters of Kalahari cover. So it's not even that the targets themselves are at surface here, the copper has actually traveled through this 20 meters of sand cover to reach surface. And what we're particularly encouraged by is that the copper um, anomalies align almost identically with the airborne surveys that we flew over the major targets. Now, it's far too early for us to start talking here about this being an economic discovery, but what we can say with a lot of confidence in that this section of the um, South Guernsey project, we are looking at a copper mineralized system. Now, we obviously have to go out and drill this, um, drill these targets. We have to get the truth detector out. We have to, to, to see both the, the grades of the copper that's present and also the volume of the copper that's present. But the targets themselves are between 120 to 200 meters depth. So if they do turn out to be economic, then we'd be looking at similar open pit style operations that have been further, have been um, created further up to the northeast of the, of the uh, geological trends that, that we're working on in this area of, of the Copper Belt. So very quickly, company funding. Uh, we've got working capital of about 1.7 million. Uh, we've pursued an extremely innovative um, funding strategy for the business. We're very well financed. We've got no immediate need to place. We have a warrant bank of four and a half million pounds that's all currently in the money. Um, we've been very careful about our joint venture partners, um, so the partnership with Power Metal Resources has enabled us to accelerate uh, progress in the Kalahari Copper Belt, while the partnership that we recently confirmed with Spectral Geoscience, that's enabled us to conduct much more extensive and more powerful surveys in the KSZ. We're in talks at the moment with a drilling company. Our, our hope is that we'll have something to announce there, hopefully in the near future. And finally, there's the Kanye Resources spin out. So our goal there is to is to spin Kanye Resources out so that it becomes an asset on the company's balance sheet. It would have been good to have explained that in a bit more time. So hopefully someone will have a question for me about that. 
And then finally, consistency of narrative. Um, if you look back through Kavango's history, um, you look at what the company's achieved in the three years that it's been listed. Um, the company's pretty much done everything that it had set out to set out to achieve. The, the airborne surveys back in 2018, they didn't work in the KSZ, but we learned from those mistakes that we made and the surveys that we then ran in 2019 enabled us to create the 3D model that's now such an integral part of our exploration strategy moving forward. So finally, um, the case for Cavango, management alignment, um, we hold 25% of the, 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 um, of the company, that's after a number of financings. We've got extremely low PLC overheads with £160,000 worth of, our direct remuneration is £160,000. We have genuine world-class projects. Everything that we've put out into the domain is backed by robust science, the methods that we've used. We're using extremely innovative technology to, to help us um, define our drill target targets, which is why we have so much confidence in them. Company funding, we've got, we're fully funded through our work program in 2021 and into 2022 with a great deal of shareholder support. And finally, consistency of narrative. We're a business that's done everything that we said we would set out to do. So when we say that we're going to drill this year with high impact drill targets, it's because we're going to drill this year with high impact drill targets. So let's ask you the tricky questions first. Mohammed Abdurman. Uh, oh, here we go. Kavanka Resources has never previously had any success despite multiple explorations. What gives you the high level of confidence that Kavanka Resources will be successful with world class mineral deposits in the future? Okay, actually, that, that question is wrong because Kavango has had a great deal of success um, on the ground. What Kavango you, has you tell them. <laughs> yeah, what, what Kavango hasn't been so successful at in the past is um, explaining how well it's done. So if you look at the four holes that were drilled in 2019, um, the company's objective with that, it had fairly limited funds at the time, so it could only um, afford to drill relatively shallow holes. The targets for mineralization that we're looking at are between sort of four to 500 meters, but the, the drill campaign in 2019, the aim was to intercept the thinner gabbros and not only break through them at the top, but also break through them at the bottom. Now, the reason that was important is because with any geophysical model that you create, you have to back it up with actual drill data. So by testing the thickness of the gabbros, what we were actually able to do was validate that our geophysical model that we've created, um, it gave us a lot more confidence that that worked. So um, I, I think it's, it is, it's definitely wrong to say there hasn't been success. Um, obviously, the companies work with limited resources. Um, and we've also had to address, you know, this, this major challenge of, of identifying the, the, the key drill targets to, to go and look for mineralization, which is what we're now looking to achieve with the TDEM surveys, um, which, we, which we've deployed this year. So um, definitely understand the question. I see the point. Perhaps things have taken too long, but you also need to think about market conditions over the last few years. It's been a very difficult market to, 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 to deliver a, a blue sky project like this. But with where we are now today, with the funding we have, have with everything we've learned about the KSZ and the KCB, we really do feel that we're set up for success. Very good. Okay, Adam Everett asks, how long does drill permitting typically take in the Kalahari Sutra zone? And based on this, when will CAV start to drill the KSZ targets recently identified? So it, it typically takes about three to four months, um, but we already have the permits in place in the, in the Kalahari Suture Zone. What we're actually waiting on are the drill permits in the Kalahari Copper Belt. Now, the reason that we're waiting at the moment is that we have, as I mentioned in the presentation, we're in fairly advanced talks with a, a drilling contractor who we think we're going to um, get into a, a strategic relationship with. And um, at this point, we've obviously got you know a limited amount of money um, that we're working with. So the reason we're not drilling just yet is we're waiting until we get the permits issued to us in the KCB. Then once we have that, our plan is to go out and use the same drill rig to drill the KSZ and then immediately follow that up with the KCB. What that will save the company is two sets of uh, mobilization costs, which is a fairly significant cost saving. Um, so at this point, it means we just have to be a little patient for about another six weeks. Okay. David Gordon asks, uh, other than Sandfire and Cooper Canyon Capital, are there any other top 20 majors currently reviewing acreage in the, in the Kalahari Copper Belt? And have any of them approached you to take a stake in your Kalahari licenses? Honest answer is I've got no idea what any majors are looking at in the Copper Belt. Um, I mean, sort of how, how could I know? In terms of um, approaches to us, we're still a bit early stage. Um, until we've actually been able to um, prove any economic 
um, copper in particular in the, in the copper belt. It would be premature for us to have those sorts of discussions. Um, but obviously, you know, if we do uh, manage to make a hit, the fact that we're with the um, power metals uh, JV, we're, we're neighboring sand fire, we're in the right geological postcode. You know, I, 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 I wouldn't expect that it would take too long before we started to have some people knocking on our door. Uh, David Gordon also asks, which kind of takes us into that, that power metal area, has the opportunity for AIM Juniors to hold cross interests in each other's Kalahari acreage been considered as a way to hedge risk in case you don't find commercially viable deposits in your own projects? Well, I mean, that, that's exactly what we've done with the with the Power Metals joint venture. I, I imagine the question is maybe asking about some of the opera, other operators that are in this space. Other operators, indeed. Yeah, I, I mean, look, you could potentially get everybody all to work together, but this is obviously a competitive market space. I mean, one of the things about our company is we're very confident in our, our technical team and our reading of the regional geology. And we see particular opportunity in the western half of the Copper Belt in, in Botswana that we feel is underexplored. So we think that gives Gives us quite a quite a significant competitive advantage at this stage which we believe has been demonstrated by the um, success that it looks like we've 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 achieved um, uh, in the South Guernsey project. Okay um, do you believe the potential rewards of the KSZ compared to Wazi Bay? Um, oh, I don't have a name and, yeah. uh, and or do you think current shareholders could expect to see similar rate of returns if CAV are successful in the KSZ? So this year in the KSZ is all about proof of concept. Um, at the moment, we've we've gathered a lot of circumstantial evidence that this is a system that hosts magmatic sulfide ore bodies. Um, the sixty-four thousand dollar question is being able to identify those ore bodies. Um, we're we're very. I don't know if confident is the right word, but we're very encouraged by what we've identified at A2. We're really looking forward to drilling this. But the main objective in the first uh, drill holes that we put into the KSZ will be to get to the bottom of those keel formations that I showed in the uh, in the presentation. It's uh, No one's ever achieved this in the KSZ, but what we really need to do is get drill core from the bottom of those to so that we can then obviously send that off to the various experts that we're working with to prove up the system's potential. If on the way to the bottom of the keels, we're able to intercept um, obviously metal sulfide um, bodies, then, you know, fantastic. And the upside, even with a 16 million pound market cap at this level, the upside could be absolutely incredible. Uh, final question uh, from Fraser Wood regarding target A2 and the promising conductive readings of over 3000 Siemens. Uh, what are the false positives for this type of reading and how can we be sure this is a metal ore body? Well, it's a really, really good question. I mean, look, the, the only way we can ever be sure is by getting the truth detector out, which of course is the drill bit, and go and drill it and see what's actually down there. In terms of everything that we've done to try and de-risk um, the, the, the target. We've obviously sent it off to an, the, the data that we've gathered, we've sent off to a number of um, a number of experts around the world. We believe we've already ruled out um, a, an aquifer so that we think we've ruled out a saline water body. That's one of the big risks in the KSZ, which historic exploration has encountered. There are quite large um, under, underground saline water bodies, which can give off these false positive readings. But with a with a 3000 Siemens conductance reading, there are only so many things that this could be. Um, whether or not it turns out to be a metal ore body, that's the first question. Whether or not it then turns out to be an economic metal ore body, that's then, that's obviously the big question that we'll seek to address by going out and drilling later this year. Ben Tarney, uh, we've come to the end of our fascinating evening. Thank you so much for your time.